Hello, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, wherever you are in the world, you're experiencing a huge amount of disruption. Um, and I wanted to thank you all for joining this webinar um, at a time when we're all experiencing a, a new way of working. And that's also affecting those of us who work in compliance, in investigations, helping prevent and mitigate the risks of bribery and corruption. So what we wanted to do today was bring together some experts to talk about how this disruption is affecting investigations, is affecting organizations in their efforts to prevent bribery and corruption. So I'm joined today by Jason Jones, a partner at King and Spalding, leading their special matters and investigations practice. Uh, Jason was previously an assistant chief at the FCPA unit in the DOJ. I'm also joined by Nat Edmonds, chair of Paul Hastings litigation practice in Washington, DC, who um, by chance, <laughs> no, we planned it this way, was also at the FCPA unit of the DOJ. So both have great experience of working in uh, an enforcement body, but also with a huge range of uh, clients on these matters. Um, do feel free to get in touch with both of them uh, after this webinar, and you'll have a chance during the webinar to ask questions. On the platform, there's the ability to ask questions uh, to us. And uh, by way of introduction on me, I'm Gavin Proudly. I lead the uh, due diligence business at Dow Jones. So uh, I wanted to uh, kick off really by um, asking you both you know, about your week, how it was this week, last week, next week. What are some of the immediate practical challenges and disruptions that you and your clients are facing in pursuing their compliance programs and investigations? Jason, uh, coming to you first, how's it going? Well, thanks, Gavin. It's, uh, I think like everybody on the call, it's, these are surreal times. Um, and it's certainly true for the compliance and the investigation space. Um, you know, it, it, it seems sometimes like we're sitting in a in a blizzard out there. Uh, hold up, most of us are at home or going into the office, you know, for for a bit at a time. But with all the the orders that are increasing around the country and around the globe, it's really hard to do. Um, and so, unlike the blizzard, you, you don't really have any uh, per ability to predict when when it's going to melt. Uh, when are things going to go back to normalcy? And so, what you know, had been, um, you know, early on, I think folks thought could be a, a temporary uh, distraction it has just really snowballed into, into a full-blown crisis. Um, and from, you know, our perspective, you know, with uh, speaking to clients uh, all the time and the, the conversations I think have just been increasing, one of the issues in the compliance space is there's just a lot of other priorities. Um, factories are shutting down supply chains messed up, um, schools are closed, so, so personnel have to be uh, trying to figure out how to, to deal with their families and their, um, their education. There's just a lot of other issues uh, that are top of mind, and you know, I, a lot of the discussions I have with clients are about other compliance-related topics, like you know, what, what do we do here, um, how do we comply with these stay-at-home orders, do, do we fall into the, the, those categories? Um, and so it's certainly true, uh, I think, that, you know, internal compliance folks um, just aren't able to focus, um, you know, as much as they may, maybe did three weeks ago uh, on, on anti-bribery issues. And, and secondly, I, I guess certainly a major impact to us as, as outside counsel and to our clients, the companies and individuals that we represent um, are these travel restrictions. So. You know, when we get um, either an issue that has popped up in, in a foreign country uh, or that there was some sort of a pre-existing plan to go and do something, an audit or, or whatnot in a foreign country, th th those are much more difficult now. Um, very few people are traveling internationally to do those types of investigations or compliance-related um, tasks like trainings or, or what have you. That's all a very different landscape right now. And so it is a challenge for, for folks like 
um, many of the, you on the call and for Matt and I who, who help companies investigate um, and, and try to prevent misconduct, it's hard to get a read on somebody uh, over a telephone interview, it's hard, especially if they're speaking in a different language. The logistics of that are, are difficult. You know, we had a, a, a video conference um, in, with, with some company employees in, in Kazakhstan a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, the connection keeps dropping. The, it's yeah. hard to figure out how do you get the documents to them, those types of things. So, you know, I don't know, Nat, if, if you're experiencing the, the same issues, but, but it, you know, you can do these things, re, uh, you know, remotely, but it, it's, not, it's not as easy, but you, we do what we got to do. Yeah. Nat, how, how's it going yeah, for no, you? I, I mean, I, I think that's right. I think there are a number of logistical challenges with the, the typical work that we do. And, and, and what I've been doing for the, the past week or so is, is really doing multiple conference calls or, or video calls with clients, with potential clients who, who are trying to identify how to adjust to this new environment, both the financial issues uh, as well as the, the health issues, how to take care of their employees, the, the risks that are there. Um, and and I, I see companies falling into two categories, right? There are companies that are, are trying to take full advantage of the disruption in the marketplace, right? There, there are opportunities to expand their business, to provide crucial and critical supplies, while others are in survival mode, right? They're tr they have been massively disrupted and they're, they're looking to cut costs wherever possible. And how do you do that um, and, and still deal with the, the anti-bribery and corruption issues that are there? Uh, and in my opinion, bo both of those situations uh, lead to the dangerous risk of corruption and at, at times a shift away from the strong tone at the top that, that has to be there to minimize some of the risks of corruption. Um, I'm seeing companies that are in the middle of, of trying to deliver these services with, where there are huge risks for them. There's fast tracking of third parties. There's, there's skipping over due diligence to, to, to find ways to um, get product to market, to, to uh, respond to the impact of coronavirus. Um, you may have to remodel the risk approach, how to be flexible on, on your typical compliance policies that, that um, you're, you're working with in order to, to move quickly through these issues. Um, you also have companies that are on the other side, on the flip side, are, are looking for savings and are cutting back on their compliance programs, um, cutting back on their staff, um, putting the internal uh, resources um, on hold, pausing internal investigations um, because they're in survival mode. Um, that may, will have an impact in, in the long run as well because um, compliance builds on itself. It, it has its own momentum, and if, if yep. you slam on the brakes, it, it's really hard to get it restarted, and it will make it much harder um, when, this, um, uh, when this current situation passes and, and we move to a different type of normal. I think great. Thank you both. I mean, I think that getting it, getting compliance and particularly anti-bribery compliance into perspective at the moment is um, is really tough, isn't it? You know, you talked about lots of other priorities. Organisations are thinking that this represents an existential threat to their business. You know, they they could go under uh, as a result of this crisis. Last on their mind is you know. Have we ordered that due diligence report? Have we instructed that investigation and so on? So that other priorities, I think that's a really key point. Let's come back to those two types of companies um, later on, the sort of those that are taking full advantage um, and are seeking growth uh, and those that are thinking, how do we cut costs? Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Before we do though, I want to, you know, you've both got a huge amount of experience with uh, obviously working in, but working with regulators and enforcement bodies. Um, are they suffering the same problems in terms of their workload? Is the, is the crisis causing a pause or a halt in their activity? What are you seeing from people like the DOJ? So, so I'll start with, with this one, and this is Nat. I, I mean, I think. Um, Paul Hastings has a, has a number of, of different internal investigations that are active, got different monitorships or self-reporting uh, in the FCPA space that, that we're dealing with um, with DOJ. And, and ultimately, we're seeing a mix of different responses. Some seem to be paused um, for the moment. Others appear to be continuing at full pace with meetings plans, with deadlines that have to be met based on court filings or, or other issues. Um, and, and I've even had one of mine that has been dormant for a while that suddenly 
popped back up again recently. Um, and I don't know if that is a sign of the individual prosecutor or, or um, the idea that if some are paused, um, the prosecutors who are dealing with their own um, situations are, are finding times to, to focus on which are the areas of investigation or review that they can progress uh, in this new environment. You've got a feel for that company that has uh, that has had a dormant investigation uh, revitalized in this time. That's that's not something they're expecting, I'm sure. Jason, um, what's your experience at the moment with with the DOJ and others? Um, are they are they going slower, or how are you finding it? I think yeah, so far the DOJ and, and the SEC um, and the U.S. Attorney's offices, you know, around the country are scrambling just like the rest of us in the in the near term. I think this week um, people are probably getting a little better at working from home than last week, just like the rest of us. Um, and so I, I do think there'll be a little bit of a, a pause, at least in terms of trying to reallocate priorities, figure out what can be done from home, um, all of those things. But I, I would not expect uh, a more sustained uh, pause or, or um, delay. I mean, you know, I, I think the last time I can remember, as a, you know, professionally, where there was this type of disarray uh, at DOJ was 9/11, which obviously very different on a number of levels. But um, you did have a Department of Justice that was uh, very much scrambled, and, and people were moving to different priorities. Um, but life, you know, went on, and slowly, you know, the, the wheels of justice sort of continued. I, I think there's some very unique. Uh, issues here that were, were did not apply there, um, and you know I think that includes when the rights of uh, defendants uh, and the right and, and the issues of public health start to come into conflict. Um, so for companies uh, or folks on on the call who may have uh, individual um, targets and you know human beings who are under investigation some of whom may be uh, incarcerated awaiting trial, those types of things, that's a real issue because, you know, if the courts are effectively shut down, you've got statute of limitations issues, you have a Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial, you've got statutory rights. And so what do you do with that um, if you can't bring people together? I, I, I saw a report recently that the Southern District of New York uh, began holding grand jury investigations by like group video, like a Zoom type of situation, which is, <laughs> I'd never heard uh, of such a thing, and I don't think anybody else has. Um, I'm not even sure logistically how that works, but but that's the reporting we're seeing. So yeah. uh, there's a lot there's a lot on the horizon, and things are are going to get a lot more complicated uh, before they get easier. So I guess what we're, you know, what we're saying is, if you are a company that's currently under some kind of investigation or, or monitoring. Um, it does sound like they need to continue to prioritize these activities. That although there may be some flexibility from the DOJ and others, um, they need they'll need to have a good plan in place for why there might be delays and so on. Uh, Nat, you know you've got a lot of experience working with organisations that are in these sort of situations. How are they going to explain to the DOJ that they're disrupted? I mean, I, I think that the, the facts are, are always on the company's side in, in these cases and, and need to be able to, to articulate a, a strong argument and explanation of, of a plan that's in place, right? We, if this is a two-week issue, um, I think DOJ is, would put it on pause and, and be fine with it. But, but if it is going to be longer than that, um, there needs to be an explanation of, of how the company is addressing these, these fraud and corruption issues that are there. How are you planning to, to address those? How are you planning to continue to prevent the bribery and corruption even in a, in a disrupted marketplace? Um, and ultimately, there needs to be an explanation of what is your long-term plan? What is your long-term um, strategy of how to address these issues? Um, because that is uh, what they're going to want to see. That there are going to continue to be statute of limitation issues for the government. They're going to want to investigate individuals. They are going to uh, have to deal with the trials that are coming up and evidence that they need to collect. Um, so that does not stop. And so a company needs to have a plan in place about how to address these issues, both in the immediate crisis time, um, where I think DOJ will be very flexible, but in the longer term, there needs to be a strategy about how to approach it 
um, and how to, to meet those obligations that, that the department has and that a company um, that is under investigation uh, has in, in interacting with the department. Great, thanks. So keep going with it. Uh, don't, you know, it, although there are other priorities, this is still one of your top ones. I suppose that's the, that's the message. So we've talked about some practical disruptions that we're all experiencing. We've talked about um, how the DOJ is currently uh, operating and that although there may be delays, they don't expect you to be pressing pause at any point. It strikes me that, you know, as we're all disrupted, you know, most of us are experiencing a level of disorientation that we've not felt before. Um, the operating models that businesses have have been thrown up in the air. So it's a time where organizations are going to be dealing with a whole range of, of new risks. Um, Jason, I wanted to come to you and think through what are the what are the risks people are facing right now in the heat of the crisis? Um, I think you mentioned, you know, we've mentioned before about organizations fast-tracking um, stuff. Uh, we've talked previously before the call around um, how people might not be available to give approvals and so on. What are the risks that people are facing right now? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I think they're, they're numerous. Um, I think one of them relates back to something Matt was just mentioning, which is what do you do? I mean, put aside for a second, I guess, whether DOJ is already investigating you, but what does a company do if a, a, an emergent issue arises? So, you know, somebody reaches out and says, you know, for a pharmaceutical company that, um, you know, a, a tip to the whistleblower line about some improper uh, interaction with a government official um, in, in X country. What, what do you do about that? Um, because you can't go there, you don't have the resources um, necessarily to, to run it to ground like you would otherwise. And I think that becomes a risk because there's so much disarray and so much else going on that that can allow, may end up um, sort of falling to the wayside. And, and the problem there obviously is that it starts to fester um, and that the problem uh, gets worse and that, you know, DOJ, while, you know, they, look, these people are human beings, they have you know, five-year-olds running into video calls too, um, but they expect a certain amount of attention to uh, emergent issues and you know general compliance. And I think it is a risk as we as, as the global market continues to be disrupted, as companies are still scrambling, that those issues will 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 grow um, because perfect is sort of the enemy of the good. Um, so I, I think I think we. We all should should re remember that and and try as best as we can to, um, you know, play whack a mole like like we usually do. Um, the, the second issue I think that is going to become increasingly interesting, and I think Nat was touching on this, is in the M and A space. Um, sure, there are you know companies who are um, active. There are companies who are in more of a damage control, stop the bleeding uh, mode, and it just depends on on the company and and it's what it sees uh, is best for its investors or its um, employees. Um, but one of the issues, either way, is that as we continue to um, you know have a populace who is scared and panicked, that corners get cut, um, the chaos sort of takes over so that uh, what normally would have been an appropriate due diligence, whether before an acquisition or after, isn't done. And um, because you're just turning to the next thing, that there's something else catches on fire and you have to move to it. And it, it, acquisitions and um, other sort of investments during this time are an increasing risk that, that merits a lot of scrutiny. Um, I don't know, Matt, if, if, if you're feeling the same way. No, absolutely. I mean, I do think that um, we're in a, a different um, business environment than, than we've been before, and, and um, that will mean that, that some companies are, are thriving and, and others are, are ripe for potential acquisition um, because stock prices are down and businesses are changed, and, and so that will lead to those type of M&A um, issues and the, the corruption issues that are always lurking um, in any deal that, that needs to be addressed. Um, 
but but I also think that the the disruption in the marketplace and and what I've seen is that certain industries are are really impacted by the the business side of the the coronavirus, right? And and that there is an absolute need for certain types of products, right? There there's regulatory approvals, there's customs issues, there's testing, there's distribution, and a huge number of government touch points in that process on these key. Um, uh, products, key services that, that are being provided, uh, key IP issues um, that, that are, are out there as well. Contracts to deal with the impact of the virus, whether you think about their essential services or not, cleaning, security, supply chains for food, all of that is, is going to be critical and there are new and different types of government interactions at, at this stage in a, in a world where people are not necessarily focused first and foremost on corruption. And that what we've seen time and again in, in countries around the world is when there are those government touch points, especially in times of crisis, that leads to potential extortion, right? That leads to the demand side of corruption where government officials are saying, look, if you want to be able to move your product through, if you want it approved, if you want to, to be the, the distributor that gets access to, to this area, you're going to need to pay me off. Um, we we have, are dealing with uh, issues of, of what are the government takes control of, of certain industries, of manufacturing, of factories, right? What happens there about who gets selected and why? Um, those are all issues that, that are, are going to be real um, uh, as the impact of this continues to, to spread and, and need to be thought about now to kind of address those challenges and to ensure that there's a proper tone from the top and, and all the way down of, of how does your business deal with those issues. Um, uh, it's an it's important piece to, to, to go back to the ideas, as Jason noted, of when you're cutting corners and you're in survival mode and you're trying to deal with the crisis and everyone is panicked, how do you address some of the, the, the issues that are, are very significant and could put your company at, at risk? Um, and, and open you up to a, a huge amount of, of challenges, both in the moment uh, and in the years to come. And, you know, I think, I think even in times of calm, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the focus of anti-corruption compliance and um, internal inquiries and otherwise tend to focus on contracts with the government. So, you know, are we, how did the tender process go? Was there, are we eliminating the risk of corruption there? especially in times of you know panic and uh, hardship it's also the lower level touches with the government that sometimes get um you know second fiddle um so i'm for example customs uh, brokers customs interactions licensing um taxes all of these low level government employees around the globe are feeling the same pinch that um, everybody else is, and sometimes more so. They're terribly underpaid in many countries. And so in, in, when people are scrambling to meet the basic human needs of their families, you can see how um, that does create uh, the demand side. And moving your product across borders to the extent that's possible, um, licensing, approvals, taxes, th those are all areas that, that need to you know, need, need attention, especially, uh, especially now. This is, um, I don't, I don't want to add to the gloom, <laughs> uh, but, um, it's, I mean, this is really interesting that the point you're making about the increased necessity to interact with government and public officials in this crisis because of everything that's happening, um, is also matched by the disruption organizations are facing within their own teams uh, to get the right um, approval, to get the right authorization. Maybe they're not able to get hold of in-house counsel because you know they've gone off sick. So um, you've got this increase in opportunity for bribery and corruption, and at the same time, a disrupted team internally for organizations. Um, are you, you know, are you guys, are you seeing within the clients that you're working with are you seeing the teams themselves that you're interacting with significantly disrupted and affected by the crisis in terms of just capacity as well as their operations? 
Jason. Yeah, sure. So you, you're you're speaking of internal teams or yeah. external? Yeah. So I think internally, there's no question. There's you know they a lack of resources. Um, you know, people. It's hard to get anything done when you're not at the office uh, with with your team. And I think people are starting to figure that out this week, and and it'll 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 get better. I think. Um, I think that. Approvals are harder to to come by uh, internally um, because people are just focused on other things and everybody's plans are just scrambled. Um, It's this increasing lack of structure and ability to sort of monitor the internal controls that you may have um, that are going to start causing more difficulty uh, and and start strain the system. Yeah, I, I've seen similar issues, right? I mean, we, we have people who are, are working remotely, but they may have a policy which requires an actual signing of a physical check, right? That may be a, a very important uh, financial control, which is important to, to have, but it is not something that can really be done in this remote working environment. What are the exceptions that, that, that have to be built um, from something like that? And, and we are seeing um, uh, on, on the in-house side, a lot of people working remotely. Um, uh, We are seeing um, some folks who have um, uh, been um, out out of the workforce now based on getting COVID-19 or a family member um, uh, getting that. So that that is a real impact, which is probably going to grow. Um, So I I do think that that the remote working is, is one aspect where where all of a sudden you will be the company will be reevaluating the the policies and procedures that are in place. Will they work? Are there antiquated issues that that don't make sense? Paper copies that really may not actually have to be done. Um, and, and then ultimately there there needs to be a, a sense of um, how do we um, cover uh, the potential impact on on our own team, uh, right? Is in terms of ensuring appropriate sharing of knowledge. Um, if someone does become ill and is out of the workforce um, or a family member becomes ill. And and that duplication of knowledge is sometimes extremely difficult in an in-house environment, especially where there's a focus on costs. Um, But the the backup capacity is is an important one uh, to ensure that the company can continue operating um, as potentially more of the workforce uh, not just on the factories, but um, but also in the, the compliance and legal side, um, are are potentially at risk. Yeah, and I, I think you know another sort of related issue here, obviously, is um, you know when you have we, we've talked a lot about the opportunity that is presented um, by the crisis for uh, misconduct and and you know bad actors taking advantage of the situation. Um, not only is there does, does that increase in the in the bribery sense, but you know a related topic that I'm sure folks are grappling with is you know the systems, you know, the systems that support your internal controls, the systems that support your ability to work from home, your IT, uh, and your data, um, because certainly uh, it would not be it wouldn't surprise me in the least if uh, some of the usual suspects, um, of state actors who are very interested in uh, data and, and utilizing, taking advantage of stealing um, cu- you know, uh, customer and proprietary data, that those issues become uh, more and more emergent now because of the stress on all the systems. Um, so you know, when you've got those stressors uh, combined with the, the risk of corruption, um, it starts to to really paint a a difficult picture, um, at least in the near term. I mean, I I think that a lot of the the work that that compliance departments do, right, you you not only have your your typical gatekeeping function of due diligence this and and, um, uh, ensuring third parties, but but there is the ongoing monitoring that that is an important part of of any strong compliance program. And and when you lose that, that ability um, or those resources are stretched and you don't have an internal audit to, to help in some of these functions. You, you not only have um, the, the ultimate challenge, the challenges with, with maintaining the work, 
but monitoring the ongoing challenges and risks of, of corruption that are endemic in, in any um, business environment. And, yeah. and so I, I, I think we need to be aware that, that yes, there are new risks that are there, but, but as Jason notes, just the, the current strain on everything is going to make it extremely difficult on the anti-corruption side and, and absolutely on the, the privacy, um, cybersecurity issues, and um, all of the, the attendant risks as, as we become more remote um, and our, our overall resources are strained. Yeah. We've, we've had a question in from the audience uh, that kind of relates to this around um, the issue of internal risks and potential opportunities for internal threat actors. And it does strike me that as we are all more diff, you know, as our organizations become increasingly diffuse, um, we try and remain connected as much as we can, but we are essentially less connected. Um, that there are opportunities for, um, you know, insider threats are really growing at this point in time where perhaps the culture starts to break down, perhaps things like training don't get the focus on. Um, do either of, Are you either of you seeing or sensing an increased risk from that sort of insider threat? So this is Jason, Nat, oh, I'll, sorry, Nat, go on. No, I'll, I'll start with this one. I mean, I, I, I do think that there are risks on, on um, fraud and corruption, but I, I think the bigger risks are on, on trade secrets. Um, uh, and, and other issues where um, as people become more remote and have access to, to more of the traditional um, protected data that companies that try to are, are critical to their business, um, I do think that there is a, a potential insider threat from, from issues like that um, where all of a sudden your, your proprietary data, your trade secrets, your IP um, are, are suddenly um, much more loose in terms of um, who can access it remotely, where it can be transported to. And so I, I think that that's something where um, companies need to be taking the, the cybersecurity issues um, uh, very seriously and ensuring that there are appropriate um, protocols in, in terms of the uh, security issues associated with the most critical data for the company. Um, I think fraud and corruption will, will continue. I, I think. Um, uh, expense report fraud is probably going to go down because there aren't going to be any expense reports. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think that uh, the other risks uh, are there, and and we do need to to be aware of how um, the changes to a remote environment may alter some of the, the calculus that that we're we're trying to m improve access, but that may create its um, uh, its similar or, or different risks. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, especially in the in the sense of needing to hire, um, you know, outside parties to help the company survive in one way or the other. Um, that all of those new business relationships, depending on how they're structured, can provide uh, an entry point for um, cyber criminals and other um, you know, threat sources. Um, and it's it's something to to be concerned about and to, to be watchful for is, is making sure that one of these uh, new relationships doesn't open up um, a portal into into your trade secrets and, and customer data. Great, thank you. We're going to come. I, I want to bring us on uh, in a minute to talking about sort of risks that can emerge as we come out of this uh, crisis. Um, but uh, I wanted to come back because we've had a question from um, one of the uh, one of the folk listening around what can be done to help those that have not got experience dealing with public officials um, because th I guess the question is uh, as you mentioned that I think the more and more people are now going to be interacting with public officials in different ways than they have done previously. They may not have had experience doing that. Uh, what can we do, what can be done to help those people make the right choices, do the right thing? Are you seeing, for example, you know, people giving out increased communication around bribery risk? Are, are you seeing more online training? How can people who haven't previously had that level of interaction be helped? Sure, this is Jason. I mean, I, I think we have seen an increase in communication, and some of this is sort of um, easy 
short-term uh, efforts, which you know, pay off dividends, which is reminders, um, which can be included in a email or, or other communication to uh, employees of, you know, number one, we, the company, are you know, concerned about you and your family is priority one. Uh, in addition, we, you know, we're in a, we're in uh, dangerous times, and that, you know, it's a reminder to be, to keep an eye out for for those who would take advantage of our company and our people. Um, you know, phrasing it in a way like that, and then maybe including, you know, your existing policy or a much more uh, summary reminder, I think is is helpful in the short term to keep people on their toes. In addition to, you know, watch out for. Um, phishing and other other types of exploitative conduct, and then secondly, um, training, figuring out you know everybody's training you know schedules and you know the best intentions to have on per, in person training of through the year and an audit plan, that's all being still scrambled. Uh, none of that's going to happen the way we thought it would happen a month ago. So how do you how do you try to button that up? Um, and some of that is you know push out that. Uh, you know, more online trading than, than maybe you intended. Um, try to get people to do even a, a short uh, online uh, module. Remind your local and regional resources around the globe that maybe this is a good time to have a team meeting and talk about a number of things, uh, including um, um, the risks of corruption that, that they may not have faced otherwise. And those meetings may have to take place, you know, telephonically or yeah. By some other uh, group chat system, and some companies' infrastructure internationally isn't going to be set up too well for that. We're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that that education is is the most critical piece, and emphasizing the importance of um, of this issue for for the company. I mean, I, I think to go to to Jason's last point. I mean, some of the the people who are not used to dealing with government officials are the ones with the least access to. Uh, computers and, um, and and good technology, and they're going to be the ones who are dealing with the the government in ways that they haven't before on the factories and and at um, the distribution centers and and in a variety of different um, uh, areas around the world where where that was not a, an area of focus previously. I, I mean, I, I think just to to put this all in in context again. But before um, coronavirus, I mean, the, the, the World Bank and the UN um, have both had estimates of what the total amount of corruption is in the world. And, and that's about 3 to 5 percent of the global economy, right? And, and that's a big number. And it, it, it's about $150 million of bribes every single hour. Um, that's what it is before we hit a crisis and a panic point. Um, and, and so being aware of that, that concept and the structure of that, um, what happens when all of a sudden there, there is a panic and there is an immediate need for um, uh, supplies or, or you're dealing with things in a, in a very different way? Um, the, there, there has to be a, a, um, an education process to say that this is something that the company does not adhere to, um, that the company does not believe in. Um, another relevant statistic is that I believe it's Transparency International has a, had a global corruption barometer that they did a few years ago where they identified and where people self-reported and it was about one in four acknowledged paying a bribe in the last year. Um, and in some countries it was, it was more than that. It was over 50 percent. Um, when you have that in, in many areas around the world, it, it, it may not be the typical experience of the people who are, who are listening to this call. Um, but it absolutely is something that those are your frontline people who all of a sudden may be interacting with government officials in, in ways that they haven't before, and, and they're representing your company uh, in that. And so I, I think it's critical to, to increase the education in, in whatever way um, is possible um, uh, to ensure that, that you don't replace one problem with another, um, because I do think that, that there is going to be um, and Jason talked about this earlier after 9-11, right, that there's going to be a refocus of enforcement um, based on this. And, and what we've seen in the U.S. at least, there's been some announcements that they're focusing on, on fraud associated with COVID-19 vaccines or other things like that. And I do expect that eventually mm -hmm. the, the tide, tide will shift and the enforcement will go to, all right, how did this break down? Yeah. Why did this? 
company get this contract? Why was this factory selected and not that factory yeah. selected for production of masks? Yeah. Um, and, and that's going to be a time where a little investment on the front end um, could prevent huge numbers of problems uh, for, for the company on the back end. Nat, can I, can I ask you just to repeat that? The, uh, you came out with an interesting stat there on bribes. Oh, I think it was the level of bribery per hour, was it? Yes. So, so there's a um, – both the World Bank and the UN have had different estimates of the amount of corruption in the global economy. And, that, and, and one is 3 percent and one is 5 percent uh, of the global economy. And, and if you calculate that out per hour, um, it, it's over $150 million of bribes every single hour. Um, so during the time that we're having this conference call, in the, in the typical environment, and who knows what's happening with this economy right now, but, but it would be $150 million of bribes paid. Um, and that is everything from big contracts to paying somebody to, to um, collect your garbage uh, on the streets of Cairo. Um, right? So, so it is, it's a variety of different things, not all business-oriented. Um, but that's the, the typical um, uh, uh, status quo, um, and and in this time of disruption, I, I think that 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 number could be affected, and it will, um, for a company's perspective, you build all of these controls based on the typical way that you interact with government officials. You now have different people interacting with different types of government officials, and that opens up uh, a real risk. And the company that that wants to stay ahead of it needs to educate its employees um, and its frontline people about the risks of it, and that ultimately, in, in my opinion, no company will ever be able to prevent all of it, but the best way to protect the company is to make clear to its frontline people that this is not acceptable for the company. Um, and uh, that's the best way to build the, the record, uh, that then if there is a problem, uh, you try to deter as much as you can, but if you can't, then you, you build the, the record to, to make clear that anything was done was not done with approval uh, of the company. I'm, I mean, we've got lots of questions are coming in, and thank you to everyone who's uh, on this webinar asking questions. Um, they're all really interesting, and I hope we're managing to address most of them. I'm going to combine a few. Uh, essentially, I, I think, uh, Jason, you uh, described right at the top of the, of the hour, there's sort of two types of organizations. Those are, are taking full advantage uh, of the situation because they've got something to offer. Maybe, you know, they're a manufacturer that has relevant products and services um, versus those that are really struggling, who are looking to cut costs to just survive as a business through this crisis. One of the questions we had was around, you know, how can you possibly talk about compliance issues with executives at a time when they are facing such a existential threat? And another question was, you know, what is going to, what is the potential for the impact on compliance teams if they do find themselves cut, if they do find themselves uh, with fewer resources as we come out of this? So, Jason, I think uh, you know you you, you introduced. That idea of those those companies that are really looking to um, to cut costs. H how can you engage with enge executives about compliance issues at this point in time? Yeah, I mean it's 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 not easy. <laughs> um, there's just tremendous stressors on the system. Um, but I think the for the compliance professionals uh, who are scrambling for resources, it, it's essential to. To sit down and, and think about the priorities. Where, where, with limited resources, where are the areas that you know, we, we should focus the most? Um, what are the biggest risks that we have right now, given the emerging threats? You know, what, let's talk about that. And then, you know, it's usually um, uh, the business sometimes is, is reluctant to hear no or to hear. You know, we need more processes in place for A, B, and C, especially now that you know, the world is is on its head. But you know, it, it, that doesn't mean it, it shouldn't be done. Uh, the efforts need to be made, and I would suggest documented uh, from a you know from a, a um, going forward basis. Here's what you know we suggest: Is there an opportunity for um, 
you know, executive, executives to shut it down in, in the time of panic, of course. Um, but there's also executives who, um, I, I would think the majority, who understand, you know, the need to manage both of those things. That, you know, it, it, just because a company or people are under tremendous pressure doesn't uh, provide the right, you know, to just skirt the rules for, for me or you or a uh, company. Um, so I think, I think that's, it's just that risk is just highlighted now that we're in a, in a global pandemic. I think that there's going to be a need for, for flexibility, and, and, and there's absolutely going to be a need to say, all right, look, the, the normal process of, of due diligence and review of third parties is, is not going to be followed, but that doesn't mean that it's canceled, right? Um, it means that we've got to deal with this issue right now um, and in order to get the business to continue to flow. Um, but it, it does mean that eventually we will complete our files. Eventually we will do all of this to ensure that, that we do a look back to, to see what has happened during this time frame. And, and I think um, it, the executives are absolutely dealing with the, the crisis. They, they have to um, in order to, to ensure that the compliance and legal folks all have jobs at the end of this as well as everyone else. Um, but I, I think the, the role of, of compliance at, at this stage and, and legal on this stage is to understand what the risks are and find the ways to be flexible um, to, to address those risks, right? And, and I, I think both Jason and I, in, in our time at DOJ, we, we understand from that perspective that there are times when the, the rules, the procedures, the policies are, are changed or, or, or um, suspended at, at certain points um, for whatever reason. And, and there needs to be a good explanation for it um, and a good reason and a, and a strategy of how to address that potential gap that's occurring in this midst of this crisis. But in the long run, um, I, I think that the, the role of compliance and legal is, is going to be continue to, to be very important, especially on, on the back end um, as we move through the crisis stage. And there's just going to be a whole lot of cleanup um, uh, yeah. from, from, from the time. And, and to Jason's point on M&A issues, right, um, companies will, will have to be figuring out what are the what are the risks of buying another company compliance and legal it's going to be critical to understanding what what's there um, how to value that company what are the risks that, that come from that um, and and I do think that the the flexibility is, is going to be critical business operations will need to come first but there needs to be a message that that business operations still need to have to be acting in a, in a lawful manner um, and uh, that's I think the role that compliance can take and can be done with a very simple tone from the top messaging saying, look, we're all in crisis, but we, we still need to make sure that we adhere to the principles upon which our company is based. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. So, yeah, sorry, Nat, this is Jason. I, I'll give you an example of what Nat's referring to in terms of, you know, some risks are going to go down, some are going to go up uh, in the coming weeks. I think, you know, you're, you're, the risks of lavish entertainment and gifts, I think, is probably dropping. Um, you can't take somebody to the Olympics now because it's not happening. <laughs> you can't. You can't have big parties they're because in. they're discouraged, right? But 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 there are risks that are increasing, and and one of them that, that we're seeing is a third party risk. So especially uh, with regard to, for example, supply chain, we've got a lot of companies who have real issues with the ability to get the materials that they need to do their jobs, uh, and they rely on third parties to assist in those efforts. Um, some of those third parties may be finding it impossible to fill those roles, impossible to get the things that they need, impossible to transport them, impossible or very difficult to get clearances. And so that creates an opportunity for new third parties to sort of come out of the woodwork, if you will, and say, oh, well, you know, here we can provide this service. We can get you what you need uh, and where, where your current third party is unable to do so. And that, that's, that's something that um, while some risks, you know, I think can be um, tabled uh, or at least, you know, handled with a, a gentler touch, I think this is an area where the, the compliance departments and um, other resources need to be very vigilant on these new third parties that are uh, showing themselves. You know, how, are they, how do they propose to succeed where your existing third parties yeah. or others yeah. have failed? What, what exactly are they, are they doing to, to make that happen? And I, I think 
companies are, are um, ill-advised to ignore that risk. And it, and it strikes me that as organizations come out of this period of disruption and have to rebuild supply chains, again, they're going to be dealing with new, new third parties um, across their value chain where companies no longer exist, maybe that used to be part of their value chain and they need to build new relationships. And it strikes me that as we we're facing risks right now, but also as we emerge from this problem, um, those risks will be will be increasing as well. I don't want to end on a on a on a uh, gloomy note. Um, you've mentioned that none of us are going to the Olympics. Uh, you've mentioned that no one's going out for meals. Um, I want to talk about whether or not there's some positives coming out of this. Whether or not you can already start to see some ways of working where people are going actually this this could this could work well um you know the fact that we're all having to work remotely is driving different behaviors and maybe some of them are aren't going to be helpful to compliance programs and investigations in future um now from your perspective is there is there any sort of any silver lining that you're already seeing where you're thinking actually this is this could be better if we did something in this way. I, I think there, there are silver linings um, from this, which are very hard to see in the midst of these very big storm clouds. Um, but, but I do think that the, the change and shift to remote work um, uh, will really impact the, the way that um, uh, companies and, and law firms operate. Um, I, I think that the it, it makes it clear that the the closures of the business, the, the lack of ability to travel, um, will will have to change. Um, that means that we will not be doing as many face-to-face -face interviews. It means that we will not be doing uh, as much in-person training of employees, um, and we'll figure out how to do that, um, and we'll have to figure out how to do that effectively. Um, I, I'm a, an adjunct professor at, at, at Georgetown Law School as well, and, and we shifted to all of our uh, class training to Zoom, right? Um, professors as a whole are not very adept at, at uh, changing technology, but very quickly everyone was able to, to shift uh, to that um, process. And, and so we'll do that here as well. Um, and that overall will, will reduce costs for the company. Um, there will still be need for, for travel. There will still be need for... Um, most controversial interviews or difficult interviews to take place on, on, uh, in person, face to face. But overall, I, I think that this shift to remote work um, will allow the government regulators, DOJ, SEC, other uh, enforcement agencies around the world to accept that at times the video interview is going to work. Um, we'll, Jason and I will have to adapt our, our strategies of, of how to read a person when we are seeing them on, on video rather than uh, being able to, to read their, their full body language. Um, but overall, I, I, I do think that that will be a huge impact. Um, companies will, will be able to look at what is absolutely required for travel, what, what isn't. Um, and they will also have an opportunity, I think, during this, this time when there isn't the ability to do travel or to worry about gifts and travel and entertainment um, expenses to look at their policies overall and, and figure out what makes sense and, and what doesn't um, uh, in this time that um, where some of the more active work uh, is currently on pause. Jason, what's your what's your glass half full uh, take uh -huh. on this? What's what's going to be good that comes out of it? You know, I, I think it's been pretty. Uh, um, I mean, what a unique time. Um, you, you see people coming together from areas that you know have not uh, normally. You see reach outs and contact being made from folks you haven't heard from uh, in a while, just checking in. Um, you're, you know, here at the law firm, we're having these. You know, we'll have like a virtual uh, happy hour over like a webinar. It's just ways to keep in touch. It's important for your team um, to be able to lean on each other, um, both internally and externally. I, I just, you know, I spent a lot of time on the phone with last couple of weeks with clients who just, who just want to talk through some issues and, um, get a second ear, um, a sounding board for what's going on at their company. What, 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 
you know, what are we seeing that might be helpful to them? You know, all, all of all of which, you know, for the most part, those types of discussions are much, you know, those are on on my dime, just just talking it through. Um, you know, this is this is just unprecedented times, and it's I think a, a good experience for for some of that. I think it's also from a compliance perspective a good opportunity for people to take stock. So, you know, once you get into the groove of of working from home and have you know, some periods of quiet, if those are possible, um, to think about your program. Where, where, where should you improve in 2021, 2022? You know, how can you use this time to refocus and, and recalibrate, recalibrate your program and come up with a plan, um, reach out to your people? You know, those, those opportunities are, are sort of rare um, because there's other deadlines that have to be met. And to the extent you can find those little windows of time I think that's that's a good thing, um, a good thing for for the compliance program and probably for uh, people's um, you know uh, strategy going forward. Great, thank you both very much. I mean, I think. Um... The lack of I, I serve in a global role, and one of the things that I really, really value in my role is being able to meet with our clients around the world because um, meeting them all face to face does make a real difference for me um, as an extrovert. My life is hell at the moment, not being able to share everything with people that are sat next to me. Uh, so my family have to put up with a lot of me talking about work, um, but. I wanted to thank uh, Jason and Nat both very, very much. Hopefully, at some point, I'll get back to DC and we can uh, we can uh, do this again in person, maybe. Thank you, everyone, for being on the line. I'm sure some of you have uh, had great broadband uh, and Wi-Fi. Others not so great. Uh, if you haven't, the um, the the session has been recorded and will be available for downloading afterwards. Both uh, Nat and Jason, their contact details are on the on the landing page of this webinar. So do feel free to get in touch with them about any advice you might want. And uh, last of all, hope everyone stays safe and do remember to wash your hands. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody.